Hi, and welcome to my lecture on office gynecology. This is Doc Ina. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. Main references for this lecture include the following, Comprehensive Gynecology, UpToDate.com, and the Cervical Cancer Screening for Individuals at Average Risk, that's the 2020 guideline update from the American Cancer Society. So for the outline of my lecture, we first start with explaining how to do a thorough gynecologic history and physical exam. And for the second part, we talk about office gynecologic procedures. Four qualities have been recognized as potentially important in caring communication skills, comfort, acceptance, responsiveness, and empathy. Despite the busy demands of clinical practice, Effective communication skills enhance patient satisfaction and patient safety and decrease the likelihood of medical liability litigation. Now, this box here lists some components of effective physician communication. So this includes being culturally sensitive, establishing rapport with the patient, listening and responding to the patient's concerns, being non-judgmental, including both verbal and nonverbal communication, engaging the woman in discussion and treatment options, conveying comfort in discussing sensitive topics, abandoning stereotypes, checking for understanding of your explanations, and finally, showing support by helping the woman to overcome barriers to care and compliance with treatment. The annual well woman visit is a crucial part of general medical care. And during this visit, the healthcare provider can attend to current gynecologic concerns and promote disease prevention, assess risk for potential disease, and provide the indicated physical examination or tests. The first visit generally invokes or involves taking a complete history, performing a complete physical exam, and ordering appropriate screening or laboratory tests. Of course, the gynecologic history should start with a chief complaint. And the chief complaint is a concise statement describing the woman's problem in her own words. Then we follow this up with a history of the present illness, where the patient should be able to present the problem as she sees it in her own words, and it should be interrupted only for a specific clarification of points or to offer direction if she digresses too far. This is a general outline for a gynecologic and general history. The outline is given in a specific order for general orientation. The information, however, may be collected through any comfortable discussion with the patient that seems appropriate in any circumstance. It is important also that all aspects be covered. The pertinent gynecologic history can be divided into several parts. So first, we ask about the menstrual history, and we should include here the age of menarche, duration of each monthly cycle, the number of days during which menses occurs, regularity of the menstrual cycles, and the dates of the last menstrual period. Then we also ask about the pregnancy history. We list all the pregnancies of the patient, including chemical pregnancies, abortions, ectopic or molar pregnancy. For deliveries, the following information should be obtained. We ask about the year of the birth of her babies, gestational age at delivery, the type of delivery, infant birth weight, and any complications that may have occurred. Next, we ask her about the history of vaginal and pelvic infections, what types of infections she has had, and what treatment she received, and what complications, if there are any. Pap smear screening history is also very important, including the date of the last pap smear, the frequency of screening, and any abnormal tests and treatment. We ask her also about her contraceptive history, including methods used, the length of time they have been used, its effectiveness, and any complications. Next, we ask her about any gynecologic surgical procedures she underwent. We ask her about um, office procedures such as endometrial biopsies, vulvar, vaginal, or cervical biopsies, or if she underwent any minor or major operations, including laparoscopy or laparotomy. Next, we ask her about her sexual history. We can ask her if she's currently sexually active or has she been sexually active in the past. We also ask if they have uh, one or more current partners and if they have sex with men, women, or both. We also ask her about the symptoms of pelvic pain or discomfort. 
We also talk about her general health history. Is there any significant health problem that she has had during her lifetime, including any hospitalization or operative procedures she underwent? We also ask her about any medication she has now, or a history of smoking, alcohol, use of illicit drugs, and prescription drug abuse with narcotics. Family history should also be asked, and we ask her about serious illnesses or causes of death of any family member, or any congenital malformations, met mental retardation, or pregnancy loss in either the woman's or her spouse's family. We ask her about her occupational and social history, especially details about uh, the patient's occupation, her hobbies or other activities that may affect health or reproductive capacity. Then of course, we do a thorough physical exam. The patient should disrobe completely and cover herself with a hospital gown that ensures warmth and modesty and of course, privacy. Weight, height, and blood pressure should be taken initially. Thyroid gland should be palpated for irregularities or increase in size. Chest and cardiac system should be evaluated. The chest should be inspected for symmetry of movement of the diaphragm and also observed for respiratory effort. And this is followed by palpation, percussion, and auscultation. The heart should be examined by palpation for points of maximum impulse, for cost for size, and auscultated for irregularities of rate and evidence of murmurs and other adventitious sounds. And of course, we have to do the breast exam. The ACOG, ACS, and National Comprehensive Cancer Network all recommend clinical breast exam every one to three years for women ages 20 to 39 years old. Women are no longer instructed to examine their own breast monthly, but rather if they feel or see any concerning symptom or abnormality such as redness, pain, skin changes, or a mass. For the abdominal exam, the abdomen should be inspected for symmetry, scars, masses, distension, and visible organomegaly. Hair pattern should also be noted. The physician should listen for bowel sounds, and that's uh, auscultation. And we do abdominal percussion to differentiate fluid waves and to outline solid organs and masses. Localized percussion tenderness may suggest peritoneal inflammation. And finally, the abdomen should be palpated for organomegaly, particularly involving the liver, spleen, kidneys, and uterus, and of course, adnexal masses. And finally, we do the pelvic exam, and this should be conducted with the patient lying supine on the examining table with her legs in stirrups and a sheet draped across her. The physician should be sure that the patient is as relaxed as possible and should take a few minutes to describe the procedure and allow the patient to prepare herself. For the pelvic exam, of course, we start with inspection. For inspection, the vulva and introitus should be carefully inspected beginning with the mons pubis. This is the mons pubis. During the inspection of the pubic hair, the physician should look for evidence of body lice or pediculosis. The skin of the vulva or perineum is inspected for erythema, excoriations, discoloration, or loss of pigment, and for the presence of vesicles, ulcerations, pustules, warty growths, or neoplastic growths. Pigmented nevi or other pigmented lesions, varicose veins, and skin scars should also be noted. Specific structures of the vulva should be systematically evaluated. So the clitoris, which is this one, this area here, should be 1 to 1.5 centimeters in length, and any irregularities or abnormalities of the labia majora or minora should be noted and carefully described. Examine also whether the hymen is intact, this part here, whether it's uh, intact or imperforate or open, and whether the perineum gapes or remains closed in the usual lithotomy position. Perianal area should be inspected for evidence of hemorrhoids, sphincter injury, warts, and other lesions. The opening of the vagina should be inspected for presence of a cystocell or a cystourethrocell, and this is seen as a bulging of the vaginal mucosa downwards from the anterior wall of the vagina. Next, we do palpation. 
So the length of the urethra is palpated and milked with the middle finger. By doing so, irregularities in inflammation of the skin's glands, expressed pus or mucus, or a suburethral diverticulum can be noted. The area of the posterior third of the labia majora is palpated also by placing the index finger inside the introitus and the thumb on the outside of the labia. By doing so, we note for enlargements or cyst of the Bartholin glands. Next, we do the speculum exam. And the most commonly utilized speculum are the grave and the Pedersen specula. Mm. Pedersen speculum is narrower and may be more appropriate for virginal or nulligravid women and women with a history of sexual abuse, vaginal pain or dyspareunia, or postmenopausal women. And this is the grave spe uh, speculum and on the right is the Pedersen speculum. In performing the speculum exam, speculum should be warmed either by a warming device or by being placed in a warm water and then touched to the patient's leg to determine that she feels the temperature is appropriate and comfortable. Use a water-based lubricant to facilitate a more comfortable entry. Speculum is inserted by placing the transverse diameter of the blades in the AP position and guiding the blades through the introitus in a downward motion with the tips pointing towards the rectum. Once the blades are inserted, the speculum should be turned so that the transfer axis, transverse axis of the blades is in the transverse axis of the vagina. The blade should be inserted to their full length and then opened so that the physician may inspect for the position of the cervix. The physician then inspects the vagina and the cervix. If you need a more visual explanation for this text, then you can refer to my video on the OSCE on pelvic exam. Next, we do a bimanual examination. The bimanual examination allows the physician to palpate the uterus and the adnexa. So in performing the bimanual exam, the index and the middle fingers of the dominant hand are placed within the vagina, while the other hand is placed on the patient's abdomen above the pubic symphysis. The size of the uterus may be estimated by comparing with weeks of normal gestational age. The general shape of the uterus is that of a pear with the broadest portion at the upper pole of the fundus. Generally, the uterus is mobile, and if it fails to move, it may be fixed. So after palpating the uterus, we now move on to palpating the adnexa. So we do this by moving the two fingers of our right hand into the right vaginal fornix, like so, while the abdominal hand is placed just medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. And we do the same procedure on the other adnexa. Okay, so a normal or ovary usually is just three by two centimeters. So it's very small and usually you cannot palpate this. Okay, however, you may be able to palpate an enlarged ovary or an ovary with a cystic structure. So after doing the bimanual exam, we now move on to doing the rectovaginal exam. And how do we do this? So remember when you do the bimanual exam, both the fingers of your examining hand were within the vaginal canal. So by, if you want to do the rectovaginal exam or if you want to proceed to doing the rectovaginal exam, you slowly withdraw your middle finger from the vaginal area and slowly insert it to the anal area, okay? So you have the rectovaginal septum sandwiched in between your two fingers. So the rectovaginal septum is palpated between these two fingers and any thickness or mass is noted. Any thickening or nodularity of the structure may imply an inflammatory reaction or endometriosis. You also palpate the parametria using the rectovaginal examination. Now, for the second part of this lecture, we now discuss some common office gynecologic procedures. So first, we talk about cervical cancer screening tests. There are several cervical cancer screening tests, and the most popular, I think, would be the pap smear. Okay. However, the most recommended uh, cervical cancer screening test nowadays would be primary HPV testing. In fact, the American Cancer Society recommendations for cervical cancer screening that was updated in uh, 2020 
recommend that uh, individuals with a cervix initiate cervical cancer screening at age 25 years old. So it used to be 21 years old uh, a few years ago. Now it's changed to 25 years old. And they should undergo primary HPV testing every five years until the age of 65. Okay, so we can also do co-testing, that's HPV testing in combination with cytology or pap smear every five years, or if HPV testing is not available, we can do cytology or pap smear alone every three years. A co-testing or cytology testing alone are included as acceptable options for cervical cancer screening because access to primary HPV testing with a test approved by the FDA for primary screening may be limited in some settings, especially in low resource areas, such as in our country. So when do we discontinue routine screening for cervical cancer? The American Cancer Society recommends to discontinue screening for individuals with a cervix who are older than age 65 years old and with no history of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia grade 2 or a more severe diagnosis within the past 25 years and or a documented adequate negative prior screening in the 10-year period before the age of 65 years old. So what do we mean by adequate negative prior screening? This is currently defined as two consecutive negative HPV tests, two consecutive negative code tests, or three consecutive negative cytology tests within the past 10 years. This criteria, however, do not apply to individuals who are currently under surveillance for abnormal screening results. Now, do we still continue screening for cervical cancer for patients who are greater than 65 years old but with insufficient pap smear history? Now, individuals who are older than 65 years old without conditions limiting life expectancy for whom sufficient documentation of prior screening is not available should be screened uh, until criteria for screening cessation are met. So it means that even if you're 65 years old already, but you have uh, insufficient pap smear history, then you should be uh, still undergoing uh, cervical cancer screening until you, the criteria for screening cessation are met. Cervical cancer screening may be discontinued in individuals of any age with limited life expectancy. Now, at this point, let's talk about Papa Nicolau smear. Okay, so in 1943, Papa Nicolau and Trout demonstrated the value of vaginal and cervical cytology as a screening tool for cervical neoplasm. With the use of the pap smear in screening programs, the incidence of invasive cervical cancer has been reduced by 50%. So in a pap smear, we usually get our samples from the transformation zone because this is where uh, abnormal cells are usually located or are seen. No pap smear screening is necessary after a complete hysterectomy done for benign conditions. However, if a supracervical or subtotal hysterectomy was performed, the same screening guidelines pertain as if there had been no hysterectomy. And why is that so? Because the cervix remains inside too. The goal of the pap smear is to collect cells from the transformation zone of the cervix, as I've already mentioned uh, one slide back, and the presence of adequate endo and ectocervical cells ensures that this area is captured in the specimen. Now, in doing a pap smear, you may use any of the collection devices as listed here. You can use an air spatula, a cytobroom, a cytobrush, or cotton pledgets, especially if you're in a low-resource low area. After excess mucus is gently removed, the ectocervical area and the endocervical canal are swabbed. The collected material is placed in a liquid preservative solution, that be this one, or smeared on a glass slide and sent to the pathologist. When you use um, a liquid preservative solution, usually this is used uh, using a cytobrush or a cytobroom, 
okay, you can also do HPV testing. However, if you just use the cotton pledget and smear it here in the glass slide, then that would be purely cytology without HPV testing. When you use the liquid preservative solution using a cytobrush or a cytobroom, then you can do co-testing, meaning you can do both pap smear and HPV testing. So here are some um, pictures showing to you how a pap smear is uh, being done using the different collection devices. So here is a cytobrush that's inserted in the, in the cervical canal. This is a cytobroom that's also inserted into the uh, cervical canal. And this is using the Aegis spatula. So if you're just doing a pap smear or cytology alone, you can smear that on a glass slide and then send to a, your pathologist. Or if you want to do co-testing, that's HPV test with a pap smear, then uh, you, you dip these devices in a liquid uh, preservative solution. So this is an example of a pap smear official report. So the first part of the report states whether the sample is satisfactory or unsatisfactory. A sample may be unsatisfactory if there is lack of a label, loss of transport medium, scant cellularity, and contamination by foreign material or blood. The report indicates whether the cellular material is normal. If other than normal, the abnormalities are further divided into squamous and glandular. The cytologist may also comment on whether there is evidence of infection such as yeast or changes consistent with the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis. We also have uh, what we call reflex HPV testing, which is also called triage HPV testing. And this is performed when a cer cervical cytology result or a pap smear result uh, returns positive for atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance or ASCOS. And um, because of this result, an HPV test is uh, performed on the sample that was collected for the cervical cytology. So another cervical cancer screening method that we can do, especially in low resource settings, is visual inspection. Visual inspection of the cervix using Lugol's iodine is actually the very first method used for cervical cancer screening. And this was introduced in 1930s by Schiller. That's why it's also called Schiller's test. However, the Schiller's test has very poor specificity and was almost entirely replaced by the advent of pap smear or cervical cytology. Visual inspection of the cervix has emerged as a screening tool that is used in low resource uh, settings. Visual inspection can be performed using acetic acid and that we call that uh, VIA, or we can also use Google solution and that's called a uh, VILI. Visual inspection is indicated for patients for whom cervical cancer screening is recommended and for whom these methods are the best screening option, meaning uh, these patients do not have access to cervical cytology and human papillomavirus testing. Active cervicitis is treated before visual inspection because inflammation and infection impede accurate assessment of epithelial abnormalities. All the vaginal infections do not appear or do not interfere with evaluation. Treatment before visual inspection may allow the patient to be more comfortable during the examination. So how do we do visual inspection? So first prepare the equipment. So you have, you should have a speculum, light source that can illuminate the cervix. If you're using acetic acid, then you have to prepare 3 to 5% acetic acid. Or if you want to use Google's iodine, you should prepare 4 to 5% Google's iodine. You should, also have, um, you should also have large cotton swabs, sponge holding forceps for application of acetic acid or iodine. So first, we position the patient in the dorsal lithotomy position, then insert the speculum and visualize the cervix. So inspect the cervix and note for any lesions and ensure that the entire cervix is visible and that the squamo-columnar junction is visible in its entirety. Then apply either the acetic acid or the Lugol's iodide using a cotton swab and then wait for one minute. After one minute, you inspect the cervix again and note for any lesions or color changes. And lastly, you have to document the findings.
So for visual inspection using acetic acid, so when using acetic acid, a positive test is characterized by opaque, dense, well-defined acetoid areas, such as so, as you can see here in these pictures, that touch the squamocolumnar junction or are close to the external os or by the presence of a cervical lesion that turns acetoid. Okay? The absence of color change is a negative test, meaning you have a normal cervix. So you see here on the left is a picture of a low-grade cervical intraepithelial lesion, while on the right you have a high-grade cervical intraepithelial lesion, and you see coarse punctation on the anterior lip of the cervix. Acetic acid dehydrates cells so that squamous cells will, uh, with relatively large or dense nuclei, that's the metaplastic cells, dysplastic cells, cells infected with HPV. So these cells reflect light and therefore they appear white. Blood vessels and columnar cells are not affected by acetic acid, but become easier to visualize against the white background. It is important to note that not all acetoid lesions are diagnostic of cervical precancer or cervical cancer. Remember, this is just a screening tool. The differential diagnosis of an acetoid lesion includes changes associated with HPV infection, leukoplakia, or squamous metaplasia. Now, how about visual inspection using Lugol's iodine? When using Lugol's iodine, a positive test consists of pale yellow areas against a darker background. Uniform uptake of stain is a negative test. Okay, so these are negative um, Lugol's iodine or Schiller's test. And these are the positive BILI. Okay, so you, because you know it's positive because you can see the yellow areas. Okay, so glycogen containing cells will take up iodine and become dark brown. Non glycogenated cells, such as normal columnar or glandular cells, high grade lesions, and many low grade lesions will not take up iodine and remain light yellow. So, if you see any abnormalities using the VIA or the VILI, then those areas should be biopsied. Okay? Biopsy is important to identify patients with invasive cancer who require further treatment. Okay, so speaking about cervical biopsy, which is our second uh, office gynecologic procedure, this is a procedure to remove tissue from the cervix to test for abnormal or precancerous conditions or cervical cancer. A cervical biopsy may be done when abnormalities are found during a pelvic exam or if there are gross or obvious pathological cervical lesions. Of course, if there are already obvious pathological lesions in the cervix, you don't do uh, any of the cancer screening tests that I already mentioned. Okay, If you see any gross or obvious pathologic cervical lesions, you do cervical biopsy right away. Okay, Again, if you see any gross uh, pathologic lesions on the cervix, you don't need to do cervical cancer screening tests anymore. You proceed with cervical biopsy. It may also be done, or cervical biopsy may also be done, if abnormal cells are found during a pap smear. Okay, the third office gynae procedure is colposcopy. Colposcopy is often the first step in evaluation of women with abnormal cytology. The colposcope is a low-power binocular microscope with a powerful light source that is used to carefully examine the cervix. It is placed just outside the vagina, like so after a speculum has been inserted and the cervix brought into view. Dilute acetic acid, such as the one that we use for VIA, is applied to the cervix, and after 30 to 60 seconds, the cervix is examined. So this procedure is uh, also the same as with the VIA. Okay, So in other words, you can do VIA with uh, just your naked eye, or you can do it with the aid also of a colposcope. For a thorough and complete exam, the entire transformation zone must be assessed, and that's what we call satisfactory colposcopy. If some portions of the transformation zone cannot be visualized, then the colposcopy is considered unsatisfactory. 
as the examiner is unable to determine the presence or extent of the abnormal tissue. In the case of abnormal cytology and an unsatisfactory colposcopy, it is recommended uh, that an, an endocervical curettage be performed. Cervical biopsy should be performed on any acetoitinine. The fourth uh, gyne office procedure is cryosurgery or cryotherapy. The, this is the use of extreme cold produced by liquid nitrogen or argon gas to destroy abnormal tissue, but we usually use liquid nitrogen. This is used to treat external tumors, ablation of benign and premalignant tissues of the cervix, vagina, and vulva. For external tumors, liquid nitrogen is applied directly to the cancer cells with a cotton swab or spraying device. The fifth procedure is vulvar biopsy. Vulvar biopsy is performed to diagnose lesions or skin changes in the vulvar epithelium. For small lesions, vulvar biopsy may excise and treat the entire lesion. Indications for vulvar biopsy include the following. Visible lesion for which the definitive diagnosis cannot be made on clinical grounds. Possible malignancy. Visible lesion with presumed clinical diagnosis that is not responding to usual therapy. Lesions with atypical vascular patterns. Benign appearing lesions requiring definitive diagnosis. And white lesions uh, failing empiric therapy. Next, we have endometrial biopsy. This is endometrial sampling using a curette. This is an example of a curette, which is inserted inside the endometrial cavity and used to scrape the endometrial lining. This helps in diagnosing benign, malignant, or pre-malignant endometrial lesions. Contraindications will include pregnancy, of course, acute pelvic inflammatory disease, cervical cancer, acute cervical or vaginal infection, and cervical stenosis. Next, we have hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy is the direct visualization of the endometrial cavity via the cervix using an endoscope and a light source. So we insert the endoscope inside the endometrial cavity for direct visualization of the endometrial cavity. Various infusion media are used for uterine cavity distension, which is necessary for inspection. Many surgical instruments and devices are available for diagnostic biopsy and pathology removal and therapeutic procedures. And this is the most frequently used uh, procedure in the evaluation of abnormal uterine bleeding for both pre- and postmenopausal women. For more details on hysteroscopy, please do check out my uh, lecture on hysteroscopy. Next, we have sonohysterosal pingogram, or what we also call saline infusion sonography, or SISH. This is a procedure to test patency of fallopian tubes, especially for women who have infertility issues. It is best to schedule during the week following the end of menses to avoid a possible pregnancy and also get better definition of the uterine cavity when the endometrium is still thin. Prophylactic antibiotics is mandatory. Okay, so we have to give doxycycline 100 milligrams twice daily for three days, starting one day prior or two days prior to the procedure. Now, if a hydrosalpinx is seen, doxycycline should be continued for one week. Next, we have office histometry. This is a urodynamic test that measures bladder pressure during the filling phase of the micturition cycle. The first urge to void, the normal desire to void, and the bladder capacity are all noted using the office histometry. The woman can cough or perform the Valsalva maneuver to detect stress incontinence in the absence of a detrusor contraction. An aseptic syringe is attached to the indwelling Foley catheter and 50 ml increments of saline is infused into the bladder. The bladder volume at the first urge to void is noted. Bladder capacity is determined by instilling saline until the patient feels unable to hold anymore. Normal values for this include the following. Residual, residual urine should be less than 50 ml. First desire to void would be around 150 to 200 ml. And bladder capacity should be around 400 to 500 ml. We also have what we call the bony test. So the fluid is drained from the bladder until 250 ml of fluid remains. The patient is instructed to cough 
and if urine spills, then that is um, indicative of urinary incontinence. The examiner's finger will be applied against the anterior vaginal wall at the pubic vesical angle, and then the patient is asked to cough. If no urine spills, then the surgery will correct the urinary incontinence. Next, we have cystourethroscopy or cystoscopy. This may be performed with a flexible or rigid telescope that allows visualization of the urethra, bladder, and ureteral orifices. Generally, saline or sterile water is used for the infusion fluid to expand the bladder. Local lidocaine jelly is inserted into the urethra for analgesia. The bladder may be visualized and the presence of inflammation, foreign bodies, urinary tract stones, anatomic abnormalities such as a duplicated ureter or benign or malignant lesions can be noted. So that's it for my lecture. So in summary, we've talked about how to do a thorough gynecologic history and physical exam. And then for the second part of this lecture, we discuss 10 common office gynecologic procedures. Thank you for watching this video and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and my WordPress site, Dokina Obigaine. Thank you.